right, guys, welcome to another episode of Behind the Visual, where I am your host, advertising lifestyle photographer Mark Hansen, and I talk to all those crazy, wonderful people who make all those visuals you see out in the world. And today, my guest is Mike Bilbrey, and Mike is a senior production consultant and art producer at Leo Burnett. And there are so many good stories in this episode that I don't even know where to begin. Um, Mike talks about the time he was in Italy for a shoot, went to location, saw it that morning or saw it the day before, everything was great, showed up the next morning and there was a 10 foot tall, 20 foot wide pile of dirt in front of the location that they were gonna shoot at. And he had to figure out how to get that out and what this little town in Italy required for him to have that bit of dirt moved where they could shoot. We also discussed his strange career path where he started out at seminary school, then decided he was going to be a history teacher, and then got knocked off into being an art producer somehow, who he thought was only going to last a year and it has ended up being 32 years. So check out that story. There's also, um, he's worked with the iconic Marlboro country, Marlboro Brown. He did a lot of those iconic shoots, those ads that were out all over the world, including Paris. Um, so that's kind of interesting, the Marlboro Man in Paris. And there's also the famous photography that he's done. We talk a little bit about Herb Ritz, Annie Leibovitz, lots of other people that you may or may not have heard of, but they're all at the top of their games, amazing photographers. And Mike's advice for new photographers, how to get um, your name out there, also for art producers, people who want to be art producers and new art producers and what you should do. So go take a listen. There are a lot more stories in this episode than what I've just talked about, and you're really going to enjoy it. It's a lot of fun, and I look forward to hearing what you guys think about it. So thumbs up it, like it, send it to your friends, that kind of thing. And yeah, hit me up and let me know what you think. Here we go. Out. I'll edit out the stuff here at the beginning. No, no worries. Do I need to sign a release? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'll actually send this to you to get you your, your approval to see it, make sure there's nothing you want to edit out. Oh, no. I'm fine. Whatever you, however you edit it, I'm sure it's fine. I had one person want me to edit out a air mm. quote. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not releasing any, you know, national secrets or anything. So well, that's probably good. No, I think I think we're fine, but thank you. <laughs> All right, yeah. Well, thank you for doing this. I appreciate yeah. it. No, I'm excited. I, I haven't done a podcast in a while, so I kind of like the, the conversation setup. I yeah, told you I, I always had a dream that I'd be on radio one day and have my own radio show, but never happened, obviously. Well, now you can do your own podcast. Yeah, I've been thinking about it. Uh, a friend of mine who works at Getty Images, I've known him forever. We've actually toyed with the idea of doing like a dual agency, you know, supplier podcast together and that would you know, be talk, cool. talking about advertising issues. And, you know, that I think it would be a lot of fun personally. I I don't know who would listen to it. It's I'd probably, listen to it because I'll, I'll, like, I'll say, okay, because for me, I know, you know, I know more than like nobody's people who aren't in the business at all, but yeah. I don't really know what goes on, say, after you call and go hey here are the parameters give us a bid an estimate whatever i send it in i don't really know what goes on before all that started i don't really know what goes on after all that started so i just know my part and then i know when i go and shoot it but i don't know what's going on with the agency and how you guys do all your stuff well if it's if it's like any other agency the creative development is long and luxurious and they have a ton of time and then I call you in a panic and I have 11 minutes to pull it all together <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, obviously you don't have production unless you have a creative idea and there's a lot of time well spent, obviously creating the creative idea. Um, but then production, sometimes you have the luxury of a, of a wonderful timeline, but sometimes, you know, you have a time span mm. and the creative idea takes this much and this isn't moving this way. It's just staying right, right here. And then all of a sudden you have this much time <laughs> to pull it all together. But you know what? It, it almost always 
comes together and yeah. we we get it executed and we have happy clients and we build brands and so i mean production can be very chaotic as as you know i mean being yeah. a photographer you are head of your own production um and you know the little needles that can go wrong and mm -hmm. you know you don't want you don't want me as the producer knowing what's going wrong i don't want my client knowing anything's going wrong right so our relationship yours and mine and your producers is always really important to the success of any shoot. So, you know, regardless of all the chaos, if you have people that um, really are dedicated and work together to make it happen, it, it always seems to happen somehow. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying there's not bumps in the road and oh, no. but yeah. sometimes you don't want to just walk off the end of a short pier and <laughs> call it a day, but... <laughs> Um, it does it does always seem to work out and i think that just my my temperament has always been i don't panic about things you yeah. know i have to keep in perspective that this is advertising it's very important to our clients to our agency mm -hmm. but you know we'll get it done and we'll do it the best we can and you know deliver the best product so that that's always my goal as a producer yeah, I'm with you. That's why I'm a it. photographer, I'm, I'm sure. I, oh, I'll yeah. Just... Yeah, I mean, I tell Ooh. everybody, I was like, this isn't brain surgery. If we make one mistake, right. we don't kill somebody. We can go yeah. back and yeah. fix it. And the goal is to not make them, but there's going to be mistakes made. It's just the way it works. Right. Well, we're all human. We're not robots. And, right. you know, we're all, we all come to the set doing the very best we can people don't come on set and say oh i'm gonna you know screw up today right uh, how many mistakes could i make today yeah. <laughs> i mean that's that's not usually i mean just an example you know i do a, i did a ton of location shoots in my day and the first thing i always did in the morning was get up and look out the window yeah. you know for weather because that was always the biggest panic now you shoot in locations where weather is generally you know agreeable la or Right. You know, the West, the West side of the United States, um, you generally don't have that, you know, need to, to worry. Or like when I shot for Marlboro all those years, if there was weather, we just shot right through it and changed, changed the scene up and put slickers on the guys. And, you know, it became a rain scene. And, you know, if there was fog, we brought out lanterns. And I mean, there were there. That was always so cool because in Marlboro country, nothing ever stopped us, which I thought was amazing. That's great. Like animals don't care if it's raining. Animals don't care if it's cold. You know, we're all standing on the sidelines and, you know, you know, somewhere in Colorado and it's five below zero at 430 in the morning as we're setting up. And, you know, the animals look just fine. <laughs> it's the right. rest of us are stuffing our, our gloves and our socks with heat warmers and, you know, standing around the chow wagon trying to drink as much hot liquid as we can okay. um but yeah i mean you know you just have to react and yeah we had one like, shoot in uh for a wrangler i had a shoot for wrangler a little a couple of years ago and it was a one two-day shoot and day one it rained all day long and everything was outside on location we were wow. literally shooting in between downpours so we would wait that's Look at the radar and go, okay, I got about 10 minutes before the rain stops, and then we're going to have about 10 minutes to shoot. So let's start right. prepping now. And so we knew yeah. as soon as that rain stopped enough, ran yeah. out, shot what we had to shoot, shot it till the rain started coming down too much, and backed out, waited again. That shoot went from 8 in the morning to about 10 o'clock that night, I think. Oh, that was a long day. Yeah, wow. and it was supposed to end at 5. And yeah. so we stretched out another 5, and luckily we had lights and we were prepared for everything, but Right. Yeah, that was. I know you just have a handy 10k in the background and simulate the sun, and you know, pray to God the rain doesn't show up in the light. And right, you know, that's that's the the fun thing about post too. You know, a lot of that can be corrected in retouching and post production. So mm -hmm. we really rely on the photographer's expertise to dance around situations like that, and you know, because it's his eye in the camera. Right. And I always defer to you you know, hey, this is the situation. What can we capture? When can we capture it? Um, I always thought it'd be nice on location shoots to have a meteorologist on set, <laughs> especially in weird climates, but we never did, obviously. But they're only right half the time anyway. Right, I know. <laughs> well, you know, I could I could do the same thing by looking out the window, I guess, not to diminish what they do for a living. I'm sure it's very 
technical and scientific, but as a producer, my, I'm just looking out the window to see, do I have a bald sky? Do I have cloudy skies? Is there a gray cloud in the horizon? You know, when and the other thing about Marlboro country is you're out in these giant, vast stretches of land that are just, that just go on forever, like Montana and oh, Colorado right. and, you know, New Mexico. I just, and when you start to see those giant storm clouds building in the horizon, they're beautiful to shoot. Right. But the closer they get, the more they <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it's a little nerve wracking, you know, when that happens. But, you know, you just take precautions and, you know, if the weather gets too bad, obviously you can't right. you know, have all your lighting and your electric equipment going and so forth. I mean, people's safety is first um, and we always put it first regardless. But right. it just I mean, sometimes those situations create the most brilliant shots oh yeah sunsets after a storm oh my god i mean just so beautiful and then you have the situations where i'm on a beach in hawaii shooting for a client we're 10 minutes into the shoot and a park ranger comes up to us and says your permit's no good you have to get off the beach oh and i look at my producer and he looks at me and i I, I have a permit right here with the seal. I, what? Why isn't it any good? It's no good. You have to get off the beach. And now I have 40 people on the beach, crew, client. Oh, yeah. You know, and I'm like, Paul, um, how do we resolve this? You know, he, he's a local producer. He was amazing, right. by the way. And um, what it came down to is the, the, the park ranger wanted a bribe to, to let us shoot. Really? And apparently that's quite wide, widespread. I, that was the only time I ever, I shot in Hawaii four times. That was the only time we experienced it. And um, it was scary because the guy threatened to arrest me and the producer if we didn't get off the beach. And so, so how finally, did you figure out he wanted to bribe? Well, Paul, the local Paul producer, knew it. Yeah, the, he kind of knew it. And uh, he said he'd, he'd never really encountered that either. He'd heard of it. Right. You know, but you get one bad apple. And so what do you do in a situation like that? You go walk over to your client and say, we'll, we'll be delayed just for a few minutes. Right. You, know, you don't put panic in them. But, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, oh, my God, every, we flew 7000 miles from two different directions to get here. You know, there's 40 people standing on the beach and we're being told to vacate. And that was that was a little trying. So Paul left. Um, we stopped shooting. Um, Paul left and went and worked some magic somewhere. Uh, I think he went to the park ranger's office and reported it. Okay. And it was an hour. It was an hour delay. Thank God it was Hawaii, so you, you have great light until eight o'clock. Right. And we were there, and it resolved itself. But those are th the odd situations that sometimes you just don't understand another another quick story is i was shooting in portofino italy for a client and we were shooting at this beautiful little street front restaurant and we went and location scouted the day before and the, the you know we paid our location fee and got the contract signed and um the next day we showed up and there's a 10 foot pile of dirt in front of the restaurant right where we're going to shoot and we were like, uh, okay, why is that giant? Pot? I mean, literally it covered, it was 10 feet high and probably 20 feet wide. And the whole front of the restaurant was obscured. And so we went in and we asked the guy who owned the restaurant. He goes, oh, you have to talk to my brother-in-law. He's the mayor. Okay. Well, he wasn't the mayor. They called him the mayor. He, okay. he thought he was the mayor. All okay. right. So we we were like, dude, what's the story? You know, and he's like, oh yeah, if you want us to move it, it'll cost you X amount of dollars. This is the day of the shoot. The day of the shoot. Now, granted, he had five guys, a truck, all ready to go. Oh, sure. But in order to move the dirt, we had to pay him to do it. Wow. So yeah, and, and and again, I have you know twenty twenty six people, talent, yeah, and Jacob ready ready to get going, and 
um they moved it <laughs> um but it's that that was a very you know those are and, and those are like the two worst examples of my 30 some year career so when you're putting that on a cost sheet what's we that heading? what's yeah, that going yeah, you, for you, you don't really <laughs> you just i mean you, you you talk to your client you talk to whomever and yeah you get it done you know every production has a little bit of slush right. money obviously yeah. you, do, you, you have to react to things oh, absolutely and uh that was an interesting um wow situation. oh yeah we'll we'll move it it'll cost you well you knew we were shooting here today right oh yeah, yeah. And so why is the dirt here well we just needed to put it somewhere right here in front of the <laughs> restaurant in the middle of the street really and it what was funny, there was a cop, you know, we hired security, local security from a cop, and he just stood there and laughed. And like shook it like I don't, what do you want me to do? <laughs> like I'm like oh. <laughs> So it just that's just I mean, I look back at it now and I, I laugh. I wasn't so happy. Oh, I bet not. And yeah. uh but you know, sometimes you gotta react to, you know, how people yeah what what people do and it's just so it's just odd to me but really that's two very extreme examples from my career that thank god it only happened twice and so tell me i look back and, and giggle now but it wasn't so funny that oh no i'm sure it wasn't no. well all right you've we've talked about this before but we haven't talked about it on the podcast so tell me how you ended up becoming a producer oh so it, it's a bit of an interesting story I'll give you the cliff notes, the cliff notes version. So um, I was in a seminary for eight years. I think I told you that that yeah. I was studying to be a priest for eight years. And uh, after college, um, I didn't go on to the final leg of the seminary. Um, you know, fell in love and thought, okay, now I I have a new path and broke my mother's heart because she had five sons and thought she was finally going to get a priest. <laughs> my mother was very devoted um catholic italian catholic lady and um she was very excited she the prospect of having a son as a priest but i broke she told me she i didn't break her heart but i think i did a little bit uh. um but anyway i was going to be a teacher i was a history major and um i was a really good friends with a nun who was a principal of an all boys high school and i signed sort of a promise contract that yeah I'd come and teach history because that's really what i wanted to do i loved history and um, so that summer before the teaching would have started, a friend of mine who worked at Leo Burnett called me and said, hey, they have a job. They have job openings here. You're so creative. You should really come in and interview. And I thought, hmm, really? Well, I don't know why I would do that. And um, the job, actually, he was, he was the director of the distribution center. But he said, you know, coming coming which was technically the mail room so he said come in come in just you know i'd love to hire you get your foot in the door and the possibilities for you would be endless because you know you're you're so creative and what know, did he what did, had you done before that he knew you were creative like what was the creative thing well we were just friends and you know i i did calligraphy professionally i okay. sang for the diocese i mean i don't know why he equated that with being creative but um you know i i liked um I liked artwork and, yeah. you know, I, I just enjoyed creative things. You know, I'd like to draw. It was a huge thing. I doodled on everything. Okay. Um, and drawing on napkins, for some reason, became a passion of mine in high school and college. So I have in in, in my garage a box, huge box of like all my doodles through high school and college. And I, for some reason, drawing with a marker on a napkin, like was the perfect medium for me so anyway i i did love to draw i like to i like to paint sort of i wasn't a good painter but i like to do it so those are the things that he thought okay. made me made me yeah. create. so just on a fluke i met him for lunch and i brought my resume and i gave it to him and now i'm just out of college i didn't really have anything on it um and i got an interview and then I had a second interview that day and then a third guy came in and interviewed me and then I interviewed with a fourth person and then they said why don't you go get some lunch which I was going to do with Kevin anyway 
And then they said, come back because there's one more person we want you to talk to. Well, there happened to be two more people that I talked to. So I interviewed with six people that day. And I, I went home. I was like, oh, that was fun. You know, whatever. Yeah. And two days later, I get a phone call from the lady who was in charge. And they offered me a job. And it was for $2,000 more a year than my teaching contract was going to be. And I thought... You know, I've never taken a risk in my life ever. Maybe, maybe I should take this risk. So I I called Sister Marianne and I said, Oh my God, I'm breaking your heart now because you know, I'm just out of college. I'm trying to establish myself. You know, it pays more. She goes, Well, we we really can't pay you more. I said, I understand. I'm gonna do this for one year, and then I promise I'll come back and teach. Cause that's really what I wanted to do. Right. And in the back of my mind, I wanted to teach art too, but teaching history was really what my goal was in life. And she was very thoughtful. We had dinner at Rosati's and I bought her dinner and we enjoyed a, a pizza and a good laugh. And she's like, no, follow your heart, follow your dream. You know, this is what your head is telling you. She was very supportive. I loved her. God rest her soul. Um, so I went to Leo Burnett in November of 1991. And in July of 92, I got... Uh, hired into the art buying department as a coordinator because in, in my role in, in the mailroom distribution center i used to like truck portfolios you know because they were heavy and cumbersome and you know i was a, a dude with muscles and it took you know they had this big cart and so i got to know the art buyers and i thought wow what you people do is really cool and we just became really fast friends and in july of 92 um there was an opening. They were they were they were hiring two new positions, uh, three new positions, three two new art buyers, and a new coordinator. And I thought, wow, this might be something cool. So I asked them if I could apply, and they were you know they were like thrilled because we'd really developed this rapport. And I knew what they did because I was trucking portfolios all the time, and I would sit and listen to them and watch what they did. And I was always kind of getting in trouble being out of the mailroom so long because I was hot bobbing <laughs> at the art buying department. Um, but they were just such a personable group and just so, you know, amazing. They were all amazing people. Um, so, yeah, so I started as an art buyer coordinator in 92 and became an art buyer in 96 or kind of an associate in 94 art buyer in 96 and then you know it evolved we were art buyers and then we became producers and um because everybody kind of went to the producer title because right. we at first we joined with print production then we left then we were taken out of print production and put in tv production um so we were you know sort of the production department um you know, TV producers did motion, our buyers did print. So right. why aren't we producers too? And the agency agreed. So they gave us all producer titles eventually. Um, and that's where it started. And so um, here we are 32 years later and I'm still in, you know, probably the best production department ever, you know. Um, you know, that's just sort of my my little journey to where i where i got to which is which is kind of fun yeah and it's a great it's story evolved. yeah it's evolved over the years um but who would have thought you know i this is not the life i ever expected for myself i expected to be mired in a high school for 30 years you know be tenured retire you know yeah. maybe teach college one day I, you know i didn't know where that path was going to take me but I never found out. <laughs> I never, yeah. The closest I came to teaching was CCD on Sundays, you know, at, at my my local parish or other parishes. And um, yeah, so it's kind of a little bit of an interesting story. I don't think it's a journey most people have going into, you know, advertising. But uh. I, tr I truly tripped and fell into it. And I'm very glad I did because, I mean, it has been an amazing 32 years so far. Um, I've met some of the most amazing people, worked with some of the most amazing photographers, um, hot, you know, celebrity, you know, world known, local. I mean, every photographer is amazing to me just by the craft and what they can do behind the lens of a camera to make a brand tell a story and 
you know, just do the narrative that the client wants to sell their brands. And it just always, always amazed me. Marlboro Country, obviously, was an amazing experience. I did that for, I think, 15 years. I, I did the cowboy. Oh, wow. No, I, I spent 15 years traveling through um, Marlboro Country, you know, all the great areas of the West, California, Utah, New Mexico, Montana, Arizona, Wyoming, Montana, yeah, Idaho, um, Oregon, Washington, um, Texas, um, shot in Hawaii a couple, uh, once from our world, the Parker Ranch, the, the, the United States' is the biggest um, uh, horse ranch, believe it or not. Oh, really? At one time, yeah. Um, I took the Cowboys to Paris for Philip Morris International and um, hobnobbed through Paris for, for 10 days shooting them. Uh, that was that was amazing uh, experience. I actually have a picture of us of standing in front on the Trocadero in front of the Eiffel Tower in my guest room um, of us standing there. It's it's a it's a great photo. Oh wow! Um, but yeah, I mean that that was I mean I did Oldsmobile for a really long time and worked with some of the best car photographers, and I loved working on automobiles because I love cars. I mean what what little yeah. you know boy doesn't love cars. I loved airplanes, so I worked on Delta. For I worked on United when I first started. I worked on Delta when we had it. I loved it. Um, Oldsmobile was amazing to work on. Even I'm sorry they're a dead brand now, but mm-hmm. we did some beautiful work. And those car shoots were just so much fun. And, you know, just, just a really good experience. So that's, you know, between Marlboro and Oldsmobile, I think that's where I really got my footing in giant large scale location production yeah. and it became sort of a, a niche of mine that I did a lot of location, you know, big, big scale location production during my career. I did, you know, obviously a lot of tabletop and still life too. And, yeah. um, but I, I kind of got tapped to do larger scale location productions, which I loved. What was your first project? Like when you became an art buyer, what was the first uh, well, my very first project was a stock project for Dean Witter, <laughs> which is now Morgan Stanley. Um, but back in the day, we were working on a Dean Witter was um, sponsoring a golf tournament. And I was um, working with the estates of famous deceased golfers because they wanted to do a retrospective on famous golfers. Okay. So I was uh, working with stock houses for archival stock images of very famous old time golfers most of most of whom were deceased at the time um but that was interesting because that's where i learned you know how do you work with the estate of a deceased celebrity oh yeah and how do you how do you negotiate that contract and work with legal to to um you know pay the estate and use their likeness and get you know permissions and so forth so that was my very first job as an art buyer uh, my very first shoot as an art buyer was a gen air project um, which was a Gen Air, if you don't know, is a sort of the high end um, line of Maytag. Um, so they had like Magic Chef, Maytag, and then Gen Air was sort of the designer line. Or yeah, the we had Gen Air grill in our house. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that was my first shoot. We shot um, some appliances on location, believe it or not, in an antique store in New Orleans. And it was like 105 degrees the day we were there and i was standing over a box fan um it was really a miserable day it was humid and, like it. but the shoot was awesome you know we shot the range and um client loved it and that was my very first photo shoot um and then my other i mean at the same time i shot uh for united airlines it actually, it was the week after. So I had like two, my first two shoots were simultaneous. The week after we were at O'Hare Airport on the tarmac shooting a DC-10 cargo plane for United's cargo service. Oh, wow. And it was really cool. We got access to the tarmac and got to drive right out right out there. And oh, that's cool. Um, we stood there while this giant plane rolled up to us and, you know, set up the shot. And it, it was because I love aviation and airplanes. So that was that was one of the coolest days in my early career and you know we got to walk around with with the with the security people we got to walk around and check out the plane and That's you know cool. standing under one of those beats is just unimaginable you know experience 
but those two shoots those are my first two shoots as 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 an art buyer oh wow yeah so you've worked with some pretty big name photographers i have yeah yeah so who was who would be your favorite and favorite project you worked with one of those so, so when i was a when i was a coordinator i used to assist um the art buyers with shoots so I don't, I don't, I mean, I'll take claim to, to working with some of these folks, but not as the art buyer, as the producer. Right. But in the early career, um, uh, Herb Ritz was really exciting. Annie Leibovitz was really exciting. Um, I partnered with an art buyer in a couple of projects. Um, you know, huge names in the industry. Herb Ritz was such a nice man, such an amazing photographer. I mean, obviously world renowned. Yeah. Um, but as a as a producer, I got to work with people like Nadav Kander and Michelle Compt, um, Tom Monroe in New York, wow. um, a really uh, high end photographer named Wolfgang Zach from Europe, uh, a guy named Eddie Coley who was really really well known and and pretty famous in Europe as well. Um, guy, I'm just I'm trying to think of the lists. Um, um, when I used to when I used to assist for an art buyer with, with an art buyer um, who shot uh, one of the major Philip Morris brands, they used some of the highest fashion photographers in the business, like Inez and Venude and um, uh, what was the one guy's name? Oh, he was real. I can't now. I'm, now I'm going to draw a blank. That kills me. Um, he was really famous in New York, a people photographer, fashion photographer. Um Oh, I knew this was going to happen. I'm sorry. All right. What was his name? Oh, it's going to drive me crazy now. Oh, my mother always said, just forget about it and it'll come to you. Yeah, exactly. That's the way um, I am. But yeah, they, they, they used some of the best photographers on Virginia Slims back in the day that, I mean, just pinnacle of fashion photographers. And um, that was always a lot of fun. Um, one One quick story is, I worked on a job for first brands way, way like in early in my career. And Robert Mitchum was the celebrity talent. I, I'm, I, I'm assuming you remember Robert. Yeah, Mitchum. I remember Robert Mitchum. Um, he was the celebrity talent and um, the producer had to get on a plane and fly to New York for the shoot. And she, her, Robert Mitchum's son was kind of coordinating his travel. And, and now uh, I had travel information for him. So I called his son who was very nice. And his son said, I'm just, I'm about to get on a plane. Can you just call my dad and tell him? And, and I thought, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, call your dad. You know, he goes, Oh yeah, yeah. Here's this number. Just, just tell him who you are. Tell him I told you to call. And, and, you know, he needs to know his flights and when the car's coming. And I'm like, Oh, okay. I'm very happy to do that. So I hung up and I'm like immediately burst into a sweat. You know, I'm about to call <laughs> Robert Mitchum, one of Hollywood's golden actors you know, king of Hollywood. Um, so I called and a lady answered the phone, a, a very nice lady with a foreign accent. And I, I Michael Bilbrey from Leo Burnett, you know, Chris uh, asked me to call Mr. Mitchum and give him some information about the sh upcoming photo shoot. And she was very nice. She goes, oh, fine, no problem. Just hold the line, please. So I'm waiting and about a minute later, he gets on the phone. <laughs> he says, you know, in his in his gruff voice, Robert Mitchum, you know, I said, hi, Mr. Mitchum, my name is Michael Bilbrey. And before I can get out from Leo Burnett and your son, Chris, told me to call you, I said, hi, Mr. Mitchum, my name is Michael Bilbrey. I don't know you. And he hung up on me. <laughs> so I panicked. I think that's the only time in my whole career at Leo Burnett I ever panicked. <laughs> and I thought, OK, my art buyer. Patty is on a plane, uh, unreachable. Chris Mitchum is on a plane, unreachable. His father just hung up on me. I'm sitting in my office all by myself, literally sweat pouring off my forehead. Oh no! Thinking, well, this was a short career. This was fun. <laughs> this was fun for the for the few years I did it. So I was. I thought, I have nothing to lose. I'm, I have to call him back. Yeah. So I called back and this the nice lady answered the phone again. And I and I explained to her, I said, could you please tell him I'm calling from the ad agency? I have information about the shoot. I said, I didn't quite get that out. And I think he 
because he didn't recognize my name, he hung up on me. I'm sure it was just a mis misunderstanding. I'm very sorry. Maybe you could give him a little advance before he picks up the line. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. He's 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 grumpy today or something, she said. And I'm like, oh, God. I said, please, please, God, let my eight years of seminary pay off this moment. <laughs> I'll never ask for another favor. I'll never ask for a winning lottery ticket. Just So a minute later, he got back on the phone and totally different guy he's like oh hello um uh, sorry about that i you know i get a lot of weird weirdos calling me <laughs> and i and i said oh I'm, I'm sure you do i i apologize i should have spoke more quickly he goes oh no no he says i you know i'm just i'm just old and grumpy today <laughs> or something to that effect he goes oh, so chris chris told you to call me huh i said yeah he wanted me to give you you know the time for your your car's coming to take you to lax and who you'll be meeting at LAX to, in the VIP room and, you know, take you to your flight. So it actually turned out to be a very pleasant conversation. And, and then, you know, he thanked me and, you know, I said, have a, have a wonderful shoot and, you know, it'll be a lot of, you know, fun for you, I hope. And he goes, Oh, you know, I hate traveling. It's, it's so boring. And, uh, but no, it was really, it was a really fun experience um, to do that. So. Yeah. Wow. And, and I hung up and literally, turned my office light off and went home because I, I, I just, I, I was mentally exhausted. After oh, sure. yeah. It just freaked me out so badly. Um, but no, I, I have worked with a lot of great photographers. I mean, some of the best car photographers, Rick Bruising and Harry Vamos and, you know, Tim, Tim Bauer and Charles Hopkins and Peggy Day, wow. um, which are all in the, in, you know, the heyday of car advertising some of the biggest names, I'm sure I'm forgetting a few, but um, loved, loved working on Oldsmobile. Um, was there I was a photographer my, that was your favorite? My favorite photographer? Did you have one or is it just... I, got, I, had, I had a lot. I, I developed a lot of great friendships with photographers. Um, the Marlboro photographers probably, Rick, like Brian Lanker, he was a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer. Um, again, God rest his soul. Uh, he shot Marlboro forever. He and I got developed a really nice relationship, um, and he was he was such an amazing photographer, and so, I mean his his artistic eye in Marlboro Country was really cool. Um, I worked with Co Redmeister, who was an Olympic athlete, wow. and and I forget which Olympics, but he was a rower in one of the um, one of the Olympic uh, Olympic Games, which is kind of a fun background. Yeah. Um, Bill Thompson, who you might know is a world famous National Geographic photographer, um, loved working with him again, just so suited from our real country. Um, I really liked working with Michelle Compt. Um, he was very prolific. Um, uh, I loved, he invited us to our, his house in Beverly Hills and had us for a little, you know, cocktail hour, you know, during a shoot one time. And nice. I mean, just he was a, he's a huge name in, in fashion, mm -hmm. but he was just we, we just developed this great relationship. And I really appreciated that because everybody was scared to death of him because, um, you know, who he was. And we just got along really great. And and I really appreciate. Yeah, you know, that's it's one thing I do appreciate in my career is I, I've developed some really great relationships and um, I, and I'm happy for that. And some of them have really become friends. Um. You know, Ron Strong is a Marlboro photographer I worked with who uh, we don't, obviously don't work together anymore because I don't work on Marlboro, but we, we remained friends all these years. And his wife, oh, my God, sent me and knitted me the most beautiful blanket um, that I use every day of my life still oh, um, wow. in, in my living room on my couch. It's just the, the nicest thing because I used to tell her how I used to freeze a Marlboro shoot. So. She sent me this gorgeous blanket that she hand knitted, which I thought was a lovely, lovely gift. Yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, there's just so many, just not even big names, just local folks. You know, I loved working with Danny Clinch out of New York. He was amazing. You know, he's like a music photographer. Yeah. Um, and we used him on a on a PM job. Um, local phot I mean, local photographers here in Chicago. Um. I have so many great relationships with people here. To name them all would be impossible. 
Um, but it's such a great community, especially food and tabletop. We have probably some, I think we have the best food, food shooters in the country here in Chicago. I mean, I know New York probably has second only to Chicago in my opinion, but some of the best food and product people. Um, and, you know, I've worked with, you know, people in New York and on the, on the, on the West coast, obviously. Um, but yeah, I just, it's just been a great run so far. And now I'm actually producing again. Um, I'm back, back in the producing game, which I'm excited about. So I hope to get to reestablish some of those relationships and, you know, work on shoots again and work with some of these great people that uh, frame my past that I haven't worked with in years because I was a consultant. So, right. um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. It'll be, it'll be a lot of fun. I think. Sounds like it. What yeah. would be, do you have a favorite project? Or is it was it the Marlboro thing? Sounds like, but was, was I, it something I, else? I, it was I, just like, yeah, I have to. Say, I've had a lot of great projects. Um, I, I've traveled all over the world from for Leo Burnett, which is amazing. But I, I, I do have to come back and say, being in Marlboro country and working with the cowboys and in those those beautiful areas of the United States. I mean, when you stand in Montana and you can just look for a hundred miles and there's nothing yeah, wow. and you know, that's your office for the day, or you're standing at the tip of the grand Canyon or, you know, you're at, you know, suicide cliff in Utah, or you're in Moab at, you know, balanced rock. And you're just, I mean, it's just, or New Mexico, I thought always had the bluest sky I've ever seen in my life. Um, it, it, it was just an amazing experience working with, with the livestock and the horses and oh. the real cowboys who are all amazing people, um, real true professionals at their craft of being a cowboy. And you know what? It's the most iconic brand in advertising. Yeah. You know, so to, to have the privilege to work on that, I, I would have to say that is that is really the highlight of my producer career um but not to discount you know everybody else you know what they bring to the table but it, it just was such an amazing experience you never worked with do you ever work with richard abaddon no but i obviously i've always loved his work and oh, i was and, thinking because he did that whole midwestern like right thing. yeah oh, maybe no, I, I never, never, somehow. Uh -huh. yeah but I, I have several of his books and really 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 like liked um what he did it just just unbelievable oh yeah so um, out of all so you've, you've you've been all over the, the world yeah where's yeah. the strangest place you ever had to go for a shoot hmm strangest place one more thing you know there's there's the obvious places new york la paris london yeah that kind of yeah thing. Yeah, right. I, yeah kind of strange like, wow. I'm trying to think. Have I ever have I ever been in a place that was strange? Or maybe uh, just like off the beaten path that you wouldn't necessarily think. Like yeah, I've had people tell me they had shoots in yeah. South America and out in the middle of nowhere kind of thing. Oh, um well, Marlboro Country takes you to the middle of nowhere, that's for sure. We <laughs> sometimes drove two and a half hours and um, you were literally out in the middle of nowhere. There was nothing around. Thank God for motorhomes because um, there was no escape. But I'm trying to think of the strangest place. Um, maybe I did a shoot in London once and the producer told us not to stray far from the motorhome because the area of London we were in was notorious for um thievery and we were shooting at night oh god um and we had security but they were very adamant about not moving away from the immediate set and i i oddly didn't think london had those kinds of areas but apparently they do um so they were very cautious of us leaving the immediate set yeah and oh, if wow. you tried if they tried they sent you back to the motorhome they're like no no you can't go you can't go there really 
Yeah. Oh, one. Th- I remember one time a shooting in San Francisco, and I was staying at this really nice hotel, and I went to the front desk, the the account girl and I, and we said, "Hey, we'd like to go have dinner somewhere." And where where would we go? And the lady behind the desk was very nice. She goes, "Well, you walk out the front door and turn right. If you walk one block, the restaurants will start. There's lovely places you can choose something, but whatever you do, don't turn left when you leave the hotel." And we were like, "Oh, okay." She goes, and, and then her whole demeanor changed. And she she was like, seriously, don't walk left. And I thought, that's funny. This seems like a very nice hotel. It was very comfortable and, very, you know, it seemed, you know, we always stayed in really nice places. Right. That was a, one of the nice perks about working for Leo Burnett. They let you stay in nice places when you're away from home. But the way she said it, that just whatever you do, don't turn left. Only go right. And we're like, okay. And so we walked out of the hotel and we turned right and about half a block down, we both turned around and looked behind us. And we were like, I wonder what's, I mean, I wonder why. Right. It just intrigued us, but she was, she was pretty adamant not to go that way, only go that way. So, and we did, we found a lovely restaurant and ate, ate outside on a, on a patio and enjoyed the evening and went back to the hotel. But when I got back to the hotel, I'm thinking, all right, what is right to my immediate left? That that's what I want to know. Make, makes me so nervous. Yeah. Um. So I think those are those are probably two that come to mind. You know, that's uh, I never, somewhere. I never had that in New York, because you know, New York, there's a million people everywhere right. every of the day. I've never obviously had that in L.A. Um, I did shoot in a cemetery in L.A. one time. Did you? Which was, which was kind of interesting and what was that for the, the, the producer uh what was that for um we're actually shooting because it looked like a park uh, okay. um and so it wasn't because it was a cemetery but it right. happened to be the cemetery um and the producer took me um was that the one where he took me over and he said come on i want to introduce you to a friend of mine and we walked over and he took me to Marilyn monroe's crypt Oh wow! Um, I, think, I think that was the shoot. I don't remember if that was it or not, but shooting in the cemetery was kind of weird. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I shot on beaches. I shot, you know, oh, I shot this amazing house in Bel Air that was vacant, and uh, the photographer, producer, told us all it was uh, on in 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 the. Um, on the list of haunted houses in in Bel Air, which I thought was really? kind of fun. Yeah, um, and I was kind of disappointed we were never there at night. You know, we were <laughs> right. there in the day, so I was like, "Oh, that's that's a shame," you know. Um, but that was pretty cool. Um, shooting in Bel Air, which was literally two blocks from Elizabeth Taylor's house, who um, I was always madly in love with, and um, I was out on the front stoop every day waiting for her car to drive by just on the chance that maybe she would come by uh, but the producer kept telling me you know you know Liz Taylor only lives two blocks from here <laughs> so at the, at, at the third day of the shoot at lunch he goes come on I have to go pick something up you want to go with me so I said yeah I'll go for a ride so he's kind of giving me a little tour of Bel Air and he pulled right into Elizabeth Taylor's driveway 609 is road and he goes oh I said what are we doing here and he goes oh this is Elizabeth Taylor's driveway and I thought, oh, I was like, oh my God, you're kidding me. You couldn't really see. You could kind of see the top of the house line, but right. you know, they have giant gates and foliage. And yeah. But so I can I can honestly say that I sat, I think it was not 600 Nimes Road or 900 Nimes Road, but I actually can honestly say I sat in Elizabeth Taylor's driveway. That's very cool. And he said we can only stay a minute because someone will come on the intercom and ask what the hell we want. So <laughs> And, and then you just say, "Oh, I'm just turning around, you know, in the driveway," yeah. <laughs> um, which is funny. But yeah, I got, I got, you know, maybe a few hundred feet from her house, and people think I'm a stalker. I'm not, but it, it just was. Hey, cool. that close. So, I had the idea of the last day of the shoot to drive by again and put a note in her mailbox, but then I thought that's a little stocky. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> well, you never know what will happen. No, it, I did. It was fun. Um, Shot in Washington, D.C. once and um, saw George Bush motorcade leave the White House. Oh, really? Senior, George Bush Sr. and Barbara. And he just sat there stoically and she she was waving like crazy to everybody. Um, 
which was kind of fun. Um, I saw Queen Elizabeth in London leave uh, Buckingham Palace. I just had a day off and I walked through St. James Park and I walked over to Buckingham Palace and all of a sudden, here comes the motorcade and Queen and Prince Philip drove out the front gate and I was maybe a hundred feet from the gate and you know everybody was gathering so I, I ran over to gather and right. there here they came right out right out the gate which was kind of fun so my wife would have loved that um yeah right yeah she's a yeah, big I, I, I thought it was pretty cool. fan. oh yeah me too I've always been an anglophile um so that that was a lot of fun London was amazing I remember my first trip to London I was so overwhelmed i added i added like four days to my trip because i wanted to stay and be a tourist and yeah i'm glad i did because it, it really was amazing i paid a cab driver to give me a driving tour of all the hot spots and oh wow i'll, I'll never forget his name was seamus he was from ireland and he was very thoughtful very nice and i said could i hire you for half a day you know i'll pay you whatever you know the rate is or whatever i guess i guess they do that on the side um and he took me down all these weird back streets and part of historical London that people don't normally see. He took me where Jack the Ripper, you know, killed all his victims. Oh, yeah, and, wow. Um, took me, you know, obviously by all the big sites, Parliament and Big Ben and um, Westminster, Westminster. And um, uh, I took him to, we went to lunch at some bar right across from St. Uh, Paul's Cathedral. And he introduced me to Bangers and Mash, which, oh, you know, yeah. which, which was kind of fun. Yep. And also Bubble and Squeak. He had Bubble and Squeak. Okay, what's Bubble and Mash. Squeak? That I don't know. It's it's a potato dish that they make. Um, um, wait, I'm, I'm trying to think what's in it. It's a potato dish. And it's like, it's like a, fr it's, you know what a frittata is? Like an egg frittata? Well, this is like a potato frittata, I think. Okay. And it had some kind of meat in it, I think. Um, but they fry it, you know, and it's bubbles in the beginning and then it squeaks when it's done, apparently. Oh, okay. Um, but the bangers and mash with sausage and mashed potatoes and yeah. in a giant, you know, soup of brown gravy that looked hideous, but it was actually quite tasty. Um, and I tried, I'm not a beer drinker, but he made me try a few different beers and i was like okay i'll never like beer <laughs> um which offended him he said i offended him by not drinking beer. well he is beer. irish i guess so yeah yeah i know i felt bad because i i, I one sip of guinness and i was like no absolutely not this is I like think if you're not a beer drinker there's no uh, beer in the world that's going to make you like uh, beer you're I not going to try it I'd rather drink turpentine i it was it was horrible but that was a fun day because you know he was a local Right. He lived, he lived in London for 20 years or whatever, was a cabbie. So he, he just took me to places that were just so cool that nobody ever sees. And, you know, like the oldest building, oldest storefront in, in London. And, um, you know, he told me how to how to do the Windsor thing, which I appreciated because I didn't really know how to do that. So I took the train to Windsor and went to the castle. And that was that was really cool. Right. Um went to church at um Westminster Cathedral which I really wanted to do whenever I traveled abroad I always tried to go to the the National Cathedral the Catholic Cathedral and go to mass um just something I did and I always yeah. picked a, a rock up off the ground by the cathedral so I have a whole collection of cathedral rocks I call oh, them. wow um which is which is really cool um just like I know nobody knows what they are but to, to right. me my little personal collection of my world travels and um that was really that was really you know cool. where each rock is from just by looking at it or do you just i i, I you know? do yeah but i have them i have them uh also in baggies with okay. a, a, yeah, piece, yeah. a piece of paper in them yeah but no i pretty much know where where they're from and uh, a friend of mine went to the vatican and i told her my story that i always collect a rock from all the cathedrals she goes oh i'll grab a rock from the vatican for you so she came back from the Vatican and she literally had like a four inch by three inch brick piece of brick. And I said, oh, my God, this is amazing. What is this? She goes, well, they were doing some cobblestone work when we walked through this one garden and they were all just sitting there. So I just grabbed this one, <laughs> this little one. I thought, oh, my God, they probably took that out of the sidewalk. Yeah. And and was, we're going to put it back in. 
and now there's a missing piece. I said, this could be thousands of years old. And she goes, oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a piece of cobblestone from the Vatican that I cherish, obviously. Um, but I'm like, oh, my God, you stole the piece. You, you, you. She said, I didn't steal it. She goes, you're very religious. It, 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 it's, a, it's a faith symbol for you. I didn't for steal sure. it. So uh, it's just a funny story. Anyway, getting off getting off track here, but oh, that's uh, all right. Those are, I mean, just a few of the. I mean, I've had some really fun. I mean, Hawaii was breathtaking. I mean, I couldn't believe I was actually sh shooting in Hawaii. Um, yeah, that's on my bucket list. We still have not been to Hawaii. Oh, it's I, I. If I could retire on Maui, I would tomorrow. That's it's, what I've heard from. It, it's my Hawaii. favorite island. It's it's. It's desert, it's rainforest, it's tropical beauty, it's you know, Haleakala, the 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 volcano, going up there for a sunrise, going back up there for a sunset. Oh my god, it was so amazing. The Hana Highway, you know, going going to the Pearl Harbor memorial was amazing. We didn't obviously yeah. didn't shoot there. That was on a on a on a, on a off day going coming home. But so moving. I mean, that that's what's cool about being a producer when you travel around the world. If you can add a day or two to kind of soak up culture, and it, it I mean, it's such a thoughtful way to see the world. And you know, yeah. one of the benefits of uprooting your life and doing the sort of job we do. So I mean, the tra I have to say, Leo Burnett was very generous with the travel. So I'm I'm very grateful for that. I have a friend who's a producer, and she was with. A big agency in new york and she said every time i flew with them it was amazing you know i'm flying business class or first i'm staying in the nicest hotels but then when i go by myself or with my family it was like we're in coach we're staying in not as nice a hotel right right so, but i love flying with the company i i remember my very first trap my very first shoot i ever traveled on um oh no i guess it was the second shoot now that i think of it was in LA. I'd never been to LA. I was like, Oh, I'm going to LA. You know, was, I told my mom, Oh, mom, I'm going, I'm going to Hollywood, you know, so much. <laughs> and, um, I got my tickets from the travel office and they said, Oh, here's your upgrade coupons. And I said, Oh, what are those? She goes, Oh, you, you'll, you'll fly first class. And I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry. What? Yeah, she goes, Oh yeah. Yeah. Here's the upgrade coupons. Just give them to the desk and you, you've already been upgraded. So here's your coupons. So I'm like, wow, okay. So I get to the airport, I check in, you know, she goes, oh, here's your seat, your first class, you know, seat, whatever. So I remember getting on the plane thinking, oh my God. Yeah. And I was thinking, okay, I could be in a classroom right now teaching boring history, <laughs> but I'm in first class on my way to LA. Amazing. It, it was pretty cool. We used to stay at the Four Seasons in LA, which was lovely. Oh, nice. Obviously, we got a... a hugely reduced rate because they called it leo burnett west because so many producers were on production in la oh, you know you'd go, to, you'd go to the four seasons and bump into 15 people you know it was like oh, being wow. an agency it was great um and they were very very thoughtful people that worked there and i mean it really was a great base to work out of um and uh, again the, the rate was you know amazing because we had so many people staying there so much with tv production and so forth but my very first trip i checked in you know it was very nice um, there was a famous uh, football quarterback who was retired, who I won't name, was sound asleep in a lobby chair, snoring his head off. And I asked the lady behind, I said, is that XX? And she goes, oh, yeah, he, he's he's a guest. He's waiting for someone. And he dozed off and he was ripping, snoring right in the lobby of the Four Seasons. But they weren't obviously going to bother him. Right. Um, and the Four Seasons was always cool because you got you saw a lot of movie stars and things. And it was just like, oh, my God, you know. Oh, that's cool. Um, but my second time, my second trip to L.A., which was like two months later. I got to the Four Seasons. Now I got out of the, the cab. The guy took my back. He goes, you can go. I'll bring you back to the to the desk. I walked in the hotel and the guy behind the desk looked right at me and said, Mr. Bilbrey, nice to have you back. And I'm like, OK. Wow. How do they know it was me? My bag is still outside. They couldn't have looked at the label. Right. And then a friend of mine says they do it on walkie-talkie. 
Uh, you know, they like, oh, my, you know, Michael Bilbrey is checking in or whatever. And but for the longest time, I thought, how the hell did they? I've been here one time. Yeah. How did I know? How did they know it was me? So I was like completely impressed by that. Oh, and, I would have been too. And I thought, oh my God, I've arrived. You know, here I'm at the Four Seasons in Beverly Hills. They, they know who I am. I got this <laughs> big hole in head. <laughs> but it was it was just fun. But we I stayed there a lot and it was was lovely and you know you go to the bar you know a lot of celebrities stay there or, or would come to the bar and have cocktails and stuff so you, you saw a lot of celebrities which was fun yeah. um i was at the bar one time waiting for a friend of mine to go to dinner and um uh who is the, the star of the pianist um i am awful with names you want an oscar for it oh my god yeah i'm i'm, I'm terrible with names sometimes i have i have terrible some timers i call it <laughs> um anyway he walked in the bar and sat right next to me really? and i looked and i recognized him right away because i love the pianist the movie and there he was sitting right next to me and i was like oh my god he's i, I mean i could i could i could move my elbow and touch him i'm like oh my god this is so exciting i saw sally field at, at um the four seasons once i saw jane fonda at the four seasons once um, I saw Sylvester Stallone there once. That was cool. Um, saw Maria Shriver one time. That was cool for me because you know yeah. I've always been a fan of Camelot and the story. And um, and they all look like just such nice. Norm- I couldn't believe how little Sally Field was. She was really so tiny. I mean, just really little. You know. Oh wow. Um, but yeah, I mean, I that was cool. Right after the whole OJ debacle. I walked. I don't. It was, I don't think it was a Starbucks at that time. It was a coffee shop, and there was a lady in front of me in this leopard leotard, and I came to realize it was Faye Resnick. I don't know if you remember who that was. She was kind of a player in the whole OJ saga. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, she stood right in front of me. That was interesting. Um, I was in Texas once and stood behind John McCain in line at a Starbucks. Really? Yeah, he was just in getting coffee all by himself. Okay. It was during the during the presidential race, so he was by himself. Yeah, he was all by, well. There might have been security around, but he was in line by himself, getting a coffee, and I was right behind him in line. Oh, wow. and I didn't realize it until he got up to the counter and I heard his voice. I'm like, oh my god, that's Sean McCain. <laughs> How is this possible? <laughs> um, that was kind of fun. Um, so yeah, I mean, just a little little side perks of traveling for production. You know, it's kind yeah, of fun. Very cool. Yeah, and it's kind of fun. So what would you mm-hmm. what would your advice be? Or well, two things actually. Mm-hmm. What would your advice be to new photographers who are trying to get the attention of someone like you, an art producer? And what would your advice be to someone who's wanting to be an art producer and thinks it would be a great job of how to get into it? Um, well, I came in a very untraditional path. So most people who come into this job are usually you know, marketing or business people, you know, major in in marketing or advertising, or you can actually major in production now. Um, A lot of schools offer it. Um, But a a traditional path is probably best, you know, a marketing degree, you know, for advertising. Like, I'm really lucky and fortunate. I fell into this and it just worked. So it was a little bit like winning the lottery for me personally, but I think the true path is, you know, have some marketing or, or production background um, because it is helpful. I came in blind. So, you know, the, the years I spent as a coordinator, I really immersed myself in it because I, you know, wasn't my background. And I, I was very lucky that the group I worked with were an amazing group of women Um at the time, the whole department was made up of women uh, who really saw that I was interested and really gave me opportunity and a path to grow and learn and um, and become the producer I am today. So, I, I mean, I have many of them to thank for just giving me a chance, first of all, um, developing a friendship, giving me a chance, and then seeing that I was wildly attracted to what they did and I really wanted to do it. So they took me under their wings and 
really helped me do it. So it, like I said, very non-traditional path. Um, if, you know, new photographers, I think, I think now in today's digital world, um, you just have to market yourself. I think email blasts are a great way to market yourself to producers, you know, keep your website very current. You know, I love, I'm old school. I love to look at a portfolio, but those are just impractical now. Your website is truly your portfolio. So update it, keep it relevant. You know, the worst thing you want to do is somebody goes back to your website six months later and there's no new work. Yeah. Shoot a sample or two every quarter, you know, change things up, get permission to use work that you've shot if if you have to um, show it because that's, that's really how producers connect with you by going to your site, looking at your work, knowing, you know, people you've worked with. But if you're a new photographer, you really have to market yourself. And sometimes that's difficult. That's in old school days. That's what a rep did, you know, to leave you to your craft, let, let them market you. Um, obviously a lot of people aren't teamed with reps anymore. Um, and there still are great reps out there and I don't, I don't dissuade anyone from having a rep. They're very, very helpful in your career build, especially if you're brand new, because it gives you sort of the opportunity to work with a professional who's been in the business for years and knows how to market you and get your name out there, um, and leave you to, you know, creating the work, not have to spend all your time marketing yourself and not giving you time to experiment and do samples and build your, you know, portfolio, your website and so forth. So, um, but it is all about marketing. Like if, if you don't introduce yourself, I'm never going to know you're there. Right. I personally, over the years, have kept a giant database of all the photographers I've loved and always wanted to work with and um, what their specialty is, where they're at. So I, I have my own personal database that I've built over the years that um, it's sort of, I call it my library of Congress for oh, photographers yeah. um, and illustrators. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of that database because, I mean, it goes back a long way. Um, even photographers who are deceased, I still leave in there because, you know, I still go back and sometimes reference their work and you right. know, want to show people this is kind of what we're looking for or whatever. Um, but I, I personally build have this database that I refer to all the time because I'm always being asked to make recommendations. Oh, sure. now, that back, now that I'm back producing, I'll be recommending for my own jobs, which is great. Um, do, you but you do, Instagram, do you think Instagram should mimic your website or should it be something slightly different from your website? Um, you I think you're, yeah, I think Instagram is a great way to, to um, showcase more uh, concentrated things on your website. I think your website is really your calling card and really your, the bread and butter of, of who you are and what you do. Um, I personally, if there's a personal work section, I always go there first because that's what a photographer's passion is about. That's what they really care about, you know, where their eye behind the lens um, captures what's most relevant to them as a person. So I always go to personal work first just to get a sense of who I'm who I'm looking at or, or what the person is about. Um, definitely have, you know, if you do multidiscipline type of photography, I'm always one to have a section for each. You can have an overview page, but don't, don't not separate it. You know, if you do tabletop and still life and um, locations and portraits, that's fine. Just separate them because an art director doesn't want to have to weed through a hundred images to find something that is relevant to what he's looking right. for. You don't want to start looking through all these portrait shots and all of a sudden there's right. a landscape and then there's product and then you're back right. to portraits and then you're back. Right. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're looking for a food shot, go to the food section. If you're right. looking for a lifestyle shot, go to the lifestyle section. Um, we, people, I mean, the, the attention span of people these days is, you know, slim to none. Yeah. So if, if they have if they have to spend more than a minute, well, you know how it is, like oh, TikTok. Yeah. You know, everybody loves TikTok because they're six second videos. If there were eight seconds, nobody would probably watch TikTok videos. Um, so yeah, it just has to be very orderly and you know your best work and and make it very easy to navigate. Um, but you you know, in order if you're new, you have to market yourself. We're never going to know you're there. If you don't introduce yourself, email blasts are a great way to do that. Um, you know, going to events like portfolio reviews, 
yeah. is a good is a good way to do that. Um, not a lot of people do in person reviews still right now because of the weird back to work structure. Oh, I've yeah. tried I tried a few. It's it's not been very successful so far with the two day three day work week. Um, because you know you're only in the office a short time, right. people can't always break away. Um, to to do have the luxury of doing that, which is which is a shame. Uh -huh. Um, but yeah, you have to market yourself. You have to get your name out there, and then it becomes word of mouth. You know, I'll say to another art producer in the city, "Oh, I saw this great," but you know, we have a great network of art producers who, you know, talk to each other. So if you That's see good. some great work, we're always sharing. You know, so I, I'm I'm never above, you know, and, and then there's like the ask art producer, oh, Facebook. Yeah you know hey i'm looking for this and you can always contribute to that and you know recommend people through there which i love i mean it's a great medium um workbook online is an amazing industry resource um i you know i think i i'm i'm on workbook online i'm not kidding probably three times at least a week wow Look, looking at photographers ad edge is an amazing resource um communication arts i love i don't get the magazine anymore but um i i just love i love that edge because they have so many really um off the beach photographers that you don't see in sort of mainstream commercial photography i mean a lot of very relevant and or uh, familiar names pardon me um but all you know for some reason they just they bring in people that you you don't normally see right um, but workbook i think their their search engine is great i really highly recommend workbook online um i love linda levy i love the product she offers um and it's really useful yeah I, I love that you can filter and look for a specific city or a specific genre of work um so i'm, I'm on it all it's the very first bookmark on my bookmarks and oh, it, right. it has been for years um you know, those are those are things yeah. you, you should consider. Now, if you're new starting out, you know, some of these things cost money, so you have to, you know, yeah. be prudent. But um I mean it, you have to make an investment, obviously, in yourself. Mm -hmm. And to get your name out, you may have to, you know, you may have to join some of these these things to to get your name out in, initially. And then, you know, as people start working with you and contacting you and word of mouth starts to spread. It it kind of works that way. So, right. so yeah. what would you say? I guess this will maybe the last question. What would you say is the most interesting or strangest thing that has happened to you since you became an art producer? Probably that I became an art producer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that is my, true. Yeah. Here's my career path: priest. Yeah. High school history teacher, producer. Yeah, yeah. That's probably the strangest That's thing. Probably true. I mean, there's been some strange <laughs> things in, in my production days that have, I mean, you know, you just take a step back and you're like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, um, I, I'm trying to think of a good example of something that was really weird, weird that happened. Um can't really think of one. I, I really, I think my career path is probably the strangest. You're probably right. Strangest yeah. thing that happened to me because which is totally a valid answer. Somebody one time yeah. said that be asked to be on a podcast was the weirdest, strangest thing that's happened to us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, that that's probably the strangest thing in my career that's happened that I actually found this career. Yeah. Um, I don't. Maybe it's not considered strange, but well, I mean, the way that, it came about. That's a, yeah, that's a pretty weird career path. Yeah. I mean. It, it, not many people would follow the same career path as, as I did. You know, I invested eight years in the priesthood. I invested, you know, like 11 minutes in being a history teacher. <laughs> and then, you know, bang, all of a sudden, you know, here but I hey, am. Tell me, tell me about the, the woman who was going to hire you to be the history teacher. Sister what, Mary. Yeah. And what did she do with your contract? Um, th oh, this is an interesting story. So about 10 years after I was at Leo Burnett, we were very good friends and um, she was kind of my spiritual advisor on the side, sort of, you know, and we'd meet for lunch or dinner at least, you know, three, four times a year. And we, we just stayed really good friends. 
And about 10 years after I worked at Leo Burnett, so around 2001 or so, um, we met for dinner and she pulled out this old manila envelope and she slid it across the table. We were at Rosati's having pizza. Like that was our favorite place. She loved, she said, you know, nuns never get pizza in the convent. So whenever I took her out to dinner, she always wanted to go for pizza. Right. <laughs> that was kind of funny. Um, so she slid this manila envelope to me across the table. I said, what's this? She goes, I don't think I need this anymore. And I, I was like, what? You know, and I opened it up and it was my original contract that I'd signed. And she goes, I don't think you're ever going to come back. <laughs> so she, 10 years after the fact, she gave me my initial contract. She goes, you know, I, I held it all these years because I thought maybe. Yeah. <laughs> said, so if I were to come, if I were to came back now, the, the, the salary would have changed on this contract, right? She goes, oh, no, you owed me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. But yeah, she gave me and I actually still have it again. It's in the garage, in my garage in a box. But it just was so funny that she kept it for 10 years. Yeah. She goes, yeah, I don't think you're going to come back now. That's crazy. And yeah, we remained friends until she died. And I just, I, I just had so much admiration for her. She was such a woman of faith and um, just such an amazing person. Um, I really miss her a lot. She was a really great friend and so supportive. And, uh, you know, when I was really struggling with the decision not, not to teach, she like never dissuaded me. She goes, you know what? Follow your brain, follow your heart. Maybe this is what you have to do for a year. You know, you, you, you just, you have to discern, you know, it's all about discernment and you have to fit, you have to do it. And if it's not for you, come back next year. You're, you're welcome. And so she never dissuaded me and she always supported it. And I, I think that's what gave me the courage to actually do it. Oh yeah. Because it was, it was such a spur of the moment thing. And it wasn't just about the two extra thousand dollars, although that was nice. Right. Um, I just was not a risk taker and she encouraged me to take a risk and I did. And 32 years later, <laughs> here I am, you know, and, uh, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad she supported it. I'm glad my family supported it. And, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, amazing. I, I, I've had an amazing career, Burnett, and I hope, you know, to finish my career, um, and just retire, you know, with all of these experiences and friends and, you know, it, it'll just be, it, it's been an amazing ride. I, I'm using the word amazing too much, but I can't, I can't think of a better adjective really than what I've been through the last 32 years. It's been, it's been an, a, a great opportunity that I never in my life thought I'd have, you know? Yeah. You know, I never thought I'd be jetting off to Europe or, you know, South America or, you know, Mexico and Canada and Hawaii and right. oh my God, you know, Asia. I, it's just unbelievable to me that that I've had this opportunity. I'm I, I am blessed. Absolutely. Full circle. Full circle. I am I am I was blessed for sure. I put, I, I put a lot of work into it too. Oh I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I mean I but you know I'm very proud of the reputation I built. I'm very proud of the friendships and and uh, professional relationships I have with photographers all over the world. And um, I am very proud of that. You know, I'm proud to always be a Burnetter. You know, I work for probably one of the most recognized ad industry giants. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that will always be in me. You know, we call ourselves Burnetters. And I'll, I'll never lose that moniker ever. You know, it'll always be part of me. So that's great. Yeah. yeah. Mike, thank you so much for doing this. This was wonderful. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely.